All right, great. Let's kick this off. So thanks everybody for joining today. We're really excited to be hosting this webinar and, and releasing an open synthetic data set for improving cyclist detection. Uh, we at Parallel Domain are here to generate synthetic data that helps improve the performance of perception and computer vision algorithms and models. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, the approaches that we're taking um, for helping solve some of the data collection and annotation problems in the uh, autonomous system space. Then we're actually going to go into some detail about uh, the data sets that we've been generating that actually help improve those models. And in particular, we're going to show some examples about cyclist detection. We're going to have a great conversation with one of our machine learning engineers, Philip Thomas. Um, and then we will also be showing you actually how to access the data set today. Uh, that data set is in fact live right now um, and is going to be available for non-commercial use. Um, I do want to say up front, you know, any researchers, academia, please go use this data set. Anybody in the commercial space that wants to use this, um, please do get in touch with us. Um, we, we want to actually enable your use of this data as well. Um, but for commercial customers, we want to make sure that you're well supported by our team. And um, we'd love the chance to engage with you and help you get the most of the data set. So we're going to hop in and, and I'll, I'll flip over to our agenda slide here. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, you know, what is synthetic data? What problem is it here to solve and how can it typically be used? And then we're going to bring in Philip Thomas from our machine learning team, and he's going to give a presentation about the data set overview uh, and the cyclist research that we've been doing and how we've been able to improve cyclist detection on some common benchmarks like, like Kitty and new images by Motional. We're then going to go into a slightly more detailed discussion, a little bit of back and forth with myself and Philip um, about the data set. And then we're also going to show you how you can access the data and where it is. Uh, and then we'll go into some uh, audience Q&A at the end and just have a bit of open discussion in case people have any questions. Uh, so we're very excited to be uh, releasing. This is our first open data set from Parallel Domain. So very excited to be releasing this and, and especially excited to share the results uh, of how we improved machine learning models going along with that data set release. So why don't we jump right in? The first thing I want to talk about is what problem can synthetic data solve? Right, and, and I like this line here of machine learning development is moving at the speed of humans and not silicon. And that's because we have a very human centric process for collecting and labeling data. So today in autonomous, especially in autonomous driving, but really in, in almost any uh, use case that's trying to do perception and computer vision in the real world, we have to plan what data we need to go collect. We typically have to put real vehicles out in the world to go collect that data. We then need to curate that data uh, and decide what of that driving or flying was actually interested enough to then go get labeled. And so a lot of companies then ship this collected data out to labeling companies that use humans to go draw labels on those images. Um, our chief revenue officer, John Wolfong, for example, comes from Scale AI, one of the companies that built up a business like that. And so we are acutely aware of a lot of the pain points in that process and how to make those better. And then once you've done all of that planning, collection, curation, and labeling, you still have to do a lot of QA on those labels that you receive back because they were done by humans and there are mistakes and humans make mistakes. It's one of the biggest reasons why we're interested in helping to automate driving is that when humans do repetitive tasks, uh, we tend to make mistakes. So all of these boxes here in red, that's a very human centric process for, for obtaining data for machine learning. It's a very slow process. So the result of this current machine learning life cycle is that it might take weeks or months per iteration to go collect and label data before you can actually start training and evaluating on that data. Typically, you'll end up collecting very unbalanced data sets. And that's actually going to be a big topic of today, which is, hey, if we go out and drive in the real world, we, we see a ton of cars, right? And we still see a lot of pedestrians, but fewer of those. But then we see very few trucks and cyclists and construction equipment and so on. So we're going to talk about class imbalance today and how it's actually very detrimental to real world machine learning performance and why that's such a big problem. Uh, and then lastly, this process is very expensive. You know, some of the bigger autonomy programs in the space spend tens and hundreds of millions of dollars a year collecting and labeling data um, just so that they can uh, go through this machine learning lifecycle and train their algorithm. So synthetic data can help address these problems. And so our mission at Parallel Domain is to accelerate computer vision and perception development 
with synthetic data. We're going to show a lot of examples of that today. Um, all the data that you're going to see, all the images and videos you see in these presentations, that's synthetic data from the parallel domain platform. And the advantage here is that we can generate this data very quickly at a very large scale with complete control over what's happening in all of these scenarios. And then all of this data comes with perfectly accurate labels, right? And so we don't have to send this data out to labeling. We don't have to go have a bunch of people QA those labels to look for mistakes. And um, so there are a lot of advantages to using synthetic data. And we're gonna show today how that actually results in training better models in the end. So a quick word about, you know, why, why do we need synthetic data? I like this line of software 2.0 requires data 2.0. For people that are familiar with software 2.0 is this term that refers to this new paradigm of software development that's typically based on deep learning or machine learning. What we want to do at Parallel Domain is bring in uh, this idea of data 2.0. That's data generated through software. And so uh, currently with the very human-centric process out in the real world, that's a very hardware and real world focused problem. We want to use software to generate that data instead. So we like to say that we're taking a real world problem of data collection and labeling and solving that with a software solution. And so let's get to the bicycle detection now. I'm starting to get specific about you know, what we're really going to talk about today and what the data set that we're releasing today does. So cyclist detection is a critical challenge. Um, cyclist deaths have increased 36% since 2010. And um, so this is a problem that is not only a, a large and serious safety issue, uh, but it's getting worse every year. Uh, globally, about 41,000 cyclists die annually in road traffic related crashes. Um, millions of cyclists are injured annually um, in these types of crashes. And most importantly here, actually collecting real world data cannot cover enough of these edge case scenarios. And we're gonna talk about how when you drive out in the real world, you don't actually see enough cyclists to be able to train accurate models relative to how often you're seeing other classes in your data sets. Uh, and so I wanna set this cyclist detection problem up as being really important from a safety standpoint, but also a really hard problem to solve with real world data. And that's why synthetic data can help solve that problem. So quick word about how we actually take real world data and synthetic data together. I think it's important to mention that we see value in real world data. All of our customers have collected and still are collecting real world data. And if you have that data, continue to use it because it is valuable. And that, those are the gray boxes here, right? Our customers collect and label real world data. They bring that into a data repository. They train their models. They then validate and test those models. What Parallel Domain can do is bring in software that can actually generate scenarios and then realistic synthetic sensor data that augments the real world data set. We mix those two data sources together and then we can train better models from that. And Philip is gonna go into a lot of details about how we actually do that. But I wanted to flash this up on the screen to show that everything we're gonna talk about today is using about using real world data and synthetic data together to actually get better model performance. And so with that, I'm going to invite Philip Thomas to come up onto the screen here, um, and he's going to share some slides and talk to you about uh, what we've specifically done here to improve uh, cyclist detection benchmarks on some of uh, the common benchmark data sets that are out there. Go ahead, Philip. So, hello, everyone. My name is Philip Thomas. I'm part of the machine learning team here at um, Parallel Domain. And as Kevin mentioned, I will walk you through our experiments on cyclist detections that we ran. And to just quickly motivate how we came about doing these experiments is we had a look at some a lot of public benchmarks that focus on object detection. And um, then we noticed that you usually see quite a big performance gap between models performances on cars and pedestrians and cyclists. And it quite quickly drops from performances like up to 90% down to like 10% or even 20% less in average precision on cyclists and pedestrians. And um, just to show you some numbers, um, we also had a look at the Kitty and the new images by Motional data set, where we um, just had a look at how often each class occurs in, in each data set. Since like Kevin already mentioned, you don't have control when you drive through the real world, what you're actually gonna see. And this also reflects itself in the class distribution that we see in those public data sets. So for example, here on Kitty, we have 83% um, labels of cars and only 4.2% labels of cyclists. And similar, it's in new images. 
So here we have 60% car labels and only 0.3% cyclists. And um, we also went ahead and trained some baseline models ourselves. And here we used a YOLO V3 model. And you can also see that we quite easily get to 80% average precision on cars. But on the other classes, we quite quickly dropped down to on cyclists at 34 to 39% average precision, which is quite significant, but not all that surprising when you see the class distribution that's actually present in your data set. So what we did then is we went ahead and just generated a data set. Actually, we generated two data set, one to fit each data set, like one to fit Kitty and one to fit Numages. And to do this, we um, just reproduced the sensor setup of those data sets. So for Kitty, um, which has one front facing camera, we made sure that we had the camera located at the set exact same position with the exact same camera intrinsics and resolution. And did the same thing also for new images. So new images has six cameras facing around the vehicle. Um, made sure that we also have the same position, same intrinsics and resolution of those. And then we took those sensor setups and passed them to our procedural um, data generation system and then told it to generate us 375 scenarios. And those scenarios we wanted to have like different weather conditions, different times of day, different um, environments like urban and suburban environments to match um, those that we have in the in new images in Kitty. But something else that's important to note, uh, mention here is that we didn't aim for creating synthetic twins of those data sets. So those data sets we generated should augment those data sets to come up with the, uh, like to solve the problems those data sets have, namely them having not enough cyclists. So what we then did is, um, as we mentioned, passed that to our data generation pipeline and then um, generated for a pod to Kitty, which we call PD Kitty, um, which in the end then had around 15% um, cyclists in it and 30% car labels. And forgot to mention that earlier that also when we generated this data, we passed to our pipeline, to our procedure pipeline, the agent distribution that we wanted to have in our final data set. So here we aim for 17% cyclists and around 35% car labels. And um, so we did the same thing also for new images. And here you can see we ended up with 32% car labels and 13% cyclist labels. And the reason why this doesn't exactly match those 17% is because not all of these instances are observed by the, by the sensors of, those, um, of the vehicle while it drove through those scenarios. So what we then did is um, set up our experiments um, like yeah, our experimentation environment. And as I mentioned before, um, we first trained our baselines. And as you see, like we had this huge class imbalance on new images, for example, which then resulted in this um, skew in performance that we also saw in those models. So what we asked ourselves is, how can we use this new data set that we now generated um, to increase the cyclist performance that we saw before? And to do that, we just wanted to tweak the data. So we wanted to take a more of a um, data-centric approach here, that, which is why we didn't touch the model or um, optimizers and so on at all. We just wanted to find out how do we best mix this data um, to get this improvement on cyclists without getting worse on the other classes like pedestrians and cars. And specifically, we looked here at joint training and fine tuning and joint training the interesting thing we wanted to find out here is how do you blend this data? Do you just put them both together? Maybe just take 50% of one data set, 50 of the other set, up data set or 80, 20, just to wanted to experiment what's best here. Or if that just is generally worse than just pre-training on synthetic data and fine tuning on real data. So as I mentioned, we just went ahead and did this. And at the very first iteration of our experiments, we could see quite heavy improvements on this. So. You can see our results on Kitty, where the bright blue bar here shows the performance on, of our baseline model on cyclists, and also the mean average position here. And the, um, the bright orange one shows the joint training results and the dark orange one, the fine tuning results. And you can see here that we just very early on got the 26% um, percent mean average uh, cyclist, sorry, a 26% average position improvement on cyclists. And this also resulted in an overall improvement on of mean average precision. And um, yeah, as you can see here on Kitty, the fine tuning worked better than joint training. And it actually was the other way around on new images, where we also saw a 13% uh, 
mean average uh, cyclist average position improvement. Um, but here, the joint training seemed to work better than um, fine tuning. And we also maybe go later into details why that is. Um, this, is this is great to see. And, and just to add something in here, Philip, I think yeah. just to make sure it's, it's clear for people which charts are show, showing which. So the blue bars are uh, real data only, right? So the blue bar on the left side is kitty only. The blue bars on the chart on the right are new images only. Both of the orange bars are the real data plus the parallel domain synthetic data set. And then the difference in those two is just whether we were joint training versus fine tuning. So that's really okay. exciting to see. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. yeah. So what we did next then is we wanted to have a more of a critical stance here and say, well, let's see how far we can get on improvements if we just use the real data that we have. And for this, we looked at class balancing. And what we did there is we looked at the, just the instances that we have in our data, for example, the, the few cyclist instances that we have, and just repeated them more often to a model and see if we could improve performance this way. And what you can see here now in the bright blue bars is our old baseline without class balancing, and the dark blue one are the ones with class balancing. And as Kevin mentioned before, like those um, orange ones are always the, the runs where we use synthetic data with. And you can see this class balancing helped a lot on, on new images but it actually makes things worse on, on Kitty. But what we then also did, like after getting an 18% um, average precision improvement on cyclists here by just doing class balancing, we also added synthetic data to this again, and then got another 7% on average of average precision out of this. So you can see like those are not, not complementary thing, but, but you can always use them in combination to get the most of it. So yeah, so this is just a, a quick high level run through through our research and I would pass it back to Kevin here. Great, thanks Philip. So now we're gonna go into a little bit more of a kind of back and forth, more in-depth discussion about not only some of the results that, that Philip showed here, but um, some other things that we saw during the research. Um, I, I do wanna note that the uh, there there is a blog post that we have on our website. You can go to paralleldomain.com, uh, click on the blog link, uh, and I believe it's the first blog on there, is this blog about cyclist detection. There's a full write-up there um, that gives you some more detail on what we did. And then if you really, really want to go into the details, uh, there's actually a weights and biases report uh, at the bottom of that blog that you can click into. And there are some interactive charts and graphs, and you can see a lot of the different runs that we did. And I think Philip is going to show some of that stuff in a minute. Um, but one of those results that, uh, Philip, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about is that I believe when, when you were training some of these models, we actually saw that in some cases, the synthetic data alone was actually beating the real data benchmark, right? And so for, for the audience here, that means that, you know, in some cases we were act actually able to get better uh, performance um, on cyclist detection um, with the just training a model purely on synthetic data than I, I believe it was on the kitty baseline. But Philip, maybe go into some detail about that. Sure. I think right here, I would just switch over to the weights and biases report you mentioned since it has a lot of details. So I already right. had it open here. Um, so what we can see here are some just more detailed results from our experiments. And here we can see um, the different bars that we showed before of mean average position, average position on bicycles, pedestrians, and cars. And the brown bar here shows the um, performance of our baseline model. And the gray bar actually is a model that's only trained on synthetic data. So what you can see here is just training on synthetic data and then evaluating on the real kitty validation set, we could already outperform this model by 5% without even having seen a real data set sample ever. Um, same also on pedestrians, which actually wasn't the goal of our data set, but we could see here like we still got some improvements from it, but you can also see we're worse on, on the car class, which also is no surprise since like we designed our data set to improve cyclist detection. And as I mentioned before, we reduced the amount of cars in our data set to come up with this imbalance or to fix this imbalance that we already seen in Kitty. But you can see those classes where we wanted to have a lot of variety in, we actually improved on those. So that's also a very interesting hint that, that it's not just about photorealism of your data, but also a lot about what's actually in your data. And the, the content matters a lot to the models, like just looking at those results here. 
Yeah, and I, I think one of the the takeaways that that's really interesting to point out for especially on the bicycle class here outperforming the kitty baseline when we generate targeted data sets and this is a big advantage of of the parallel domain platform that we've been building you can set all of these distributions and make a data set focused on bicycles or emergency vehicles or jaywalkers or traffic lights and really boost certain class examples that you might not have enough of the cool thing here, seeing synthetic data train a baseline model by itself that rivals the performance of a real world model, that means that we can use synthetic data in the full machine learning life cycle, right? It means even when you're prototyping and doing a proof of concept for a new system, you can actually use synthetic data to train a model to a level of baseline performance, which is comparable um, with what you would get with some initial real world data. And so you can use synthetic data at the very beginning of development, but then a lot of our customers and with what we showed in the, the kind of joint training and fine tuning, they're using the synthetic data in conjunction with very large real world data sets and getting performance boosts there as well. And so that means we can use synthetic data towards the middle and end of the machine learning life cycle as well. And so I think I really like hitting on that point because it shows that synthetic data can be useful for people kind of no matter where you are in that journey from, hey, I haven't even collected my first data yet all the way through to I'm trying to fine tune and squeeze out the last bit of performance. Um, we do, I also want to mention, we do have a, a video interview uh, with Adrian Gaden, the head of machine learning research at Toyota. We've got that up on our website. And um, so again, you can go to paralleldomain.com, go to the blog. There's an interview with myself and Adrian, and we sat down and spent, I think it's about 45 minutes um, talking about exactly these kinds of topics and, and how exactly, thank you, Philip, um, and how synthetic data is actually helping TRI train better models. Um, and they were able to beat the state of the art in multi-object tracking using our synthetic data. Um, they set a new benchmark for state of the art in depth uh, estimation using some of our synthetic data as well. So uh, there are two different published papers that that talk covers um, that use our data. So I, I would highly recommend going to check that out. It's really interesting. Um, so I, I think another thing I had I had here that I wanted to ask you, Philip, is that um, joint training versus fine tuning. I think we saw some interesting results where, uh, in some cases, the joint training performed better when training with synthetic and real together. Other cases, we wanted to bootstrap on synthetic and then fine tune with some of the real data. From a general perspective, what have you seen for when it might be better to use joint training versus fine tuning? What are some trends that you see there? Mm -hmm. um just quickly before I answer this question, I would also like just show some details of our actual training setup and our experiment setup to just frame it for everybody so it's easier to understand. So just quickly showing here a, a graph of how the, our training architecture could look like or how you could model it is you have a data set here on the, on the left, you fuse them somehow, run them through the data pipeline, and then you have your model architecture and your optimizer set up and you train your model. And what we actually did for our experiments is we initially trained a baseline on, as I before mentioned, YOLO v3. And there we iterated on like different optimizers and so on to, to get a good baseline. And as soon as we had this baseline, we just froze this whole setup, as well as the augmentations that we used in our data pipeline to make sure that this stays consistent for all of our experiments. Since as we mentioned before, we wanted to have a more data-centric approach here. And therefore we here wanted to focus on just comparing joint training and fine tuning and how to do those mixtures. And to come back to your question, Kevin, um, as we've seen before, we had um, like joint training work best on new images, which is actually a bigger data set compared to Kitty, which is the training set of Kitty actually is just 3,700 images, whereas um, new images has uh, 67,000 images. So what we found, if you have a like just from the trainings we ran so far, if you have a large data set and a synthetic data set that targets a certain problem of your, of your data set that you just couldn't collect so far, it's actually better to do joint training since this way you can show like the combination of the worth of both, um, of both data sets to, to your model and not just have it train on it initially and then forget about it when you train on the larger data set and just because it takes quite a while to go through large data sets. And there you have the, the potential of just unlearning all of the valuable information that you had in your synthetic data set. Whereas if you have a small real data set because you just couldn't collect enough examples, as you mentioned before, to just bootstrap what you did, you might just want to generate a synthetic data set that's very evenly balanced or um, just tackles this one problem very um, well that you want to solve like 
detecting children running on the streets, for example, and you have a lot of examples in there. So what we saw then is it's better to actually pre-train on this larger data set and then just use the small real data set that you have to fine tune and then adapt to your operational domain. So kind of bridging the, the, the little domain gap that you have and just using this data, since it's so sparse anyway that you don't have much samples, it's actually better to just use it to do your fine tuning here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, that's, that's super helpful. And we've we've often seen when we're working with customers, those types of questions, which is, you know, should I be joint training? Should I be fine tuning? How much synthetic should I use? How much real should I use? How do I mix these together? Um, you know, I think that the general answer is it really depends on the data sets that you're going to be using in conjunction with the synthetic data. And this is a great example of how um, the massively different scale of Kitty versus the new images data set actually um, showed us how taking a different approach in those two cases made a difference. Um, I also really liked that the, you know, the Kitty and the new images data sets were such a different size because I believe new images is about 20 times larger than Kitty. Um, and so that actually enabled us to show that the synthetic data can make a very positive impact on, at both a small and large real world data set size. Um, we do have a question. Um, one of the questions in the chat, I think probably would be good actually to address now. Um, it's from, from Clark. It says, uh, were these metrics generated on held out test sets and on actual sensor data test sets only? Or is the synthetic data also included in the, in the metrics results? I'll give a really quick answer, but then Philip, I'm going to let you give the more detailed answer. The quick answer here is we always only test uh, for, for these types of, of benchmarking. We only test on the real data. So we are not putting synthetic data into the test set because um, we don't want to test if we're overfitting a model to our own synthetic data set. So we're training on a conjunction of real and synthetic and then always testing on real. But Philip, do you maybe want to give some, some more details about how we kind of generated the holdout sets and things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Like totally true what you just said. Like we, we went ahead and um, for Kitty, set aside the uh, a validation split, which is also like the same size as the training split. So 3,700 images, which labeled images, which we didn't use during training. So these are just used for validation. And then no matter what we trained on, we always just use the real data to evaluate as Kevin mentioned, because otherwise we would just measure if we could learn our own synthetic data and also did the same thing for new images. So all of the results we show here are only validated on the real test set of those data sets. So no synthetic data in there. Great, awesome, thanks, Philip. Yeah, so the quick summary for Clark is, yes, we generated holdout sets of real data that we did not train on, um, and then we only tested on that real data. Okay, great. Um, I think just a, uh, two more quick topics we'll hit here, and then we're gonna jump into a quick demo for actually where, where do you get this data set? How do you download it? And, and what also resources do you have to help you work with that data set? So, um, Philip, I know you've got some slides that actually show like more qualitative results, you know, before and after image of detection, um, before adding the synthetic data versus after. Let's just maybe thumb through a couple of those quickly. I think they're interesting to see and, and maybe explain what we're looking at. Yeah, so we went ahead and just collected some images from the validation set of new images um, and then compared like what, what were actually the, the, the cases that we fixed using our data. And on the left, you can see some results of our best baseline trained on new images. So the model trained on only the real new images data. And on the right, you can see the perform, uh, some output of our model that performed best in joint training. And a lot of cases that we fixed here are actually the model completely missing certain um, cyclists in the frame. So as you can see here, or another example would be this one here where the model couldn't detect it before. And other one, which also is interesting that before the model detected a lot of cyclists just as pedestrians. And afterwards of training with our data as well, you could see that those um, labels flipping over to bicyclists or cyclists. Um, you got an example here, and I think another one will be here, the, the cyclist right in front of the car, which before was also pedestrian. And you can also see in the background, so we didn't lose any detections on cars we had before. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's always great to see those kind of before and after images that helps it make it, make it a lot more tangible. Um, all right, so the last question I had for you, Philip, is I think some people ask often, you know, what are the ratios that you're training with, real to synthetic? How much real data, how much synthetic data? So maybe if you could quickly show what ratios you all experimented with and, and which gave the best results, and then we'll, we'll hop into the um, data download demo. 
And for this, I'll just go back to our um, weights and biases page here. Um, and here we got a, a lot of different experiments that we documented on and show the examples, uh, the results for. And I think at the last sections, we looked into um, different mixture rates of um, data sets during training. So what you see here is, um, we always noted down here, the, the right number shows the percentage of um, new image we used for training. And on the left, we have the percentage of um, our synthetic data we used for training. So you can see here, we used, for example, 50% um, of both data sets or 100% of the synthetic data set and 50% of, um, of the new images data set. And those numbers are always relative to the total size of new images. So this meaning 50, 50 would mean those are the exact same number of images from both data sets that we sample. And we actually sample those randomly before and just have then a fixed subset that we join together. Um, and you can see here just scaling up the number of um, yeah, synthetic images that we add to our training also consistently scales up the performance we see on cyclists here. Um, you can see for class uh, for cars, we, we don't change much, but that's also like not, as I mentioned, the goal of our data set, since we didn't set out to fix edge cases on cars, we just wanted to say, let's make sure we get better on cyclists. You can see that's exactly what this data set did. And with increasing number of synthetic data, this improves, but also you can see compared to here, um, also increasing the um, real amount matters here. So if you, for example, you train on 70% synthetic um, and 30% real data, we are able to beat our baseline on cyclist detection already. Same if we do 50-50, but we get better results if we just use all of the real data that we have and just add our new synthetic data to it, because that's also how we designed the data set. We looked at the class distribution this data set had before and then made sure that we could balance this out with our new data set. Yeah, and also um, below, I think we did another couple of experiments here where we um, looked at the class balancing approach and then looked at splits that are like here add up in total to one. And you just see comparisons on how far you can get if you, for example, don't have that much um, real data and would say, okay, let's just use the half of new scenes and half of um, our synthetic data. And you can see we can already match the performance of the baseline. And similar also with a 70-30 split, so you're not far behind here and you get better on cyclist detection, which as I mentioned before, was the actual goal of this data set. Yeah, awesome to see in, in that level of detail. Um, fantastic. So I, I think that probably wraps up the, the discussion section here. Let's jump into a quick demo of, of where you can get the data. So Philip, I'll, I'll take the screen share back from you. Um, in the meantime, uh, I know we have a handful of questions already in the Q&A um, chat section. Um, so for anybody who wants to add a question, we're going to get to all of these at the end. But on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there should be a Q&A chat button, and you can open up the Q&A window and, and type any questions in there. So uh, happy to answer those questions at the end. Okay, so um, now probably the bit pe you know, people might be most interested in is how do, how do I get this data? So I'm going to share my screen, and, and I'm actually just going to give you a walkthrough on the website. So first thing, just go to paralleldomain.com. This is our public website here. And along the top, you'll see an open data sets button. Um, and that's going to take you to this open data sets slash bicycle detection area. Um, and a reminder, this data set is, is curated specifically for boosting the performance on bicycle detection. Um, and so that's why we've got this whole area specifically dedicated to this particular task. Um, and so there are a couple of things you can do here. First of all, there's, there's a lot of documentation here. So feel free to scroll down and explore. There are code examples and, and examples of how to use the data and what's present in the data. Um, but the first probably most interesting thing for people is that you can actually preview the data live in our web visualizer. You can do that by either clicking this preview button here or the preview data set button down here. Either way, that's going to take you to this live, live web visualizer. Um, we've got a bunch of scenes here. So you can toggle through the scenes in this left-hand panel. And then you can also change the uh, annotation type that we're looking at. So with this data set, we're releasing 2D bounding box information. We have lots of other labels that our platform generates in conjunction with bounding boxes, but because this data set is made for bicycle detection, we're shipping these uh, 2D bounding box labels. Um, and then this is all dynamic, dynamic sequence data. So we can play this data forward. Um, I think the, I believe the new images data set is at two Hertz and that's why this data is playing back at two Hertz, essentially two frames per second. 
Um, it is important to mention our platform can generate kind of any frame rate that you need. Um, and so we can generate much higher or lower frame rate data, depending on what's important to you. But feel free to explore, you know, a couple of example scenes. Um, as Philip mentioned earlier, each of the PD Kitty and PD New scenes have, I believe, over 300 different scenes within the data set. We're just showing, I think, a sampling of three or four from, from each. Um, but have a look at these and, and poke around. Um, I'm going to go back to the main page. Um, then you can also download the data set from here. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, this data set is for non-commercial use. So please, you know, if you're in the research community, if you're a student, if you're trying to do academic work, please go download this data set, use it, get in touch with us. When you click download, um, you either have to create an account. It's a very, very simple process. All you have to do is give your name, organization, and email. Um, I already have an account uh, because I work here. So I'm gonna pause my share. I'm gonna log into that account. Um, and then so you can't see all my top secret passwords. Um, and now that I've logged in, it's going to take you to this screen. Um, so if you don't have an account, pretty much all you need to do is put in a name and email and you'll get to this screen. Or if you already have an account from our public web visualizer, you'll go straight to this screen. Um, and here you just have to agree to the licensing terms. Again, it's a, a open data set for non-commercial use. Commercial customers um, or, or people working for commercial companies, we do want you to use this data, but please just get in touch with us because we want to be able to make sure you're as supported as possible as you're using the data set. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out uh, if you would like to use this data, but you're not in academia, for example. Uh, and then once you agree to these terms and you hit the download button, it will start downloading right away. So the data is here. You don't have to talk to a human to get your hands on the data. Um, you'll be able to download the zip file uh, right after filling out this form. The last thing that I wanted to touch on is, is some of the documentation that's here on the page. Another really exciting thing that we're releasing today, um, in addition to the data itself, is the Parallel Domain SDK. And this is a, a development kit with a bunch of uh, useful functions and libraries that allow people to interact and manipulate the data uh, more conveniently. So a lot of convenience fun functions for ETL, like extraction, transformation, and loading, uh, and, and getting this data actually into your ML pipeline is made easier with this SDK. There are some code examples here on the page, but also this link here will actually take you to GitHub. Um, and that will, there's a lot more documentation there on GitHub, as well as the actual code itself um, that you might need to, to use to, to interact with the data. Um, and then further um, down, something interesting to mention yep. here, um, like you can use this SDK to load our data, which we currently store in the DGP format, but you can also use the SDK, uh, our SDK to load different data set formats like new scenes, new images and cityscapes, and therefore have just one SDK that you can use to load different data sets and merge them together very easily. Yeah, super helpful. Thanks, Philip. And, and we, we envision this SDK as being a you know kind of like a baseline library for data set curation in the future right allowing you to mix and merge and split and and filter all sorts of data sets so we'll, we'll be adding more and more code to this sdk over time um, and then there's a lot more information on this page about the uh, the data set distribution, how many images, what are the distributions of classes, what are the sensor rigs that we used for each, and those sensor rigs match both the kitty and the new images uh, formats, but there's just extra information here about how all of that works. So um, if you need more information about the data set, feel free to explore this page. Um, so yeah, that... That concludes the, um, the, the presentation portion of this. Um, I do want to add a quick plug. We are recruiting. We are hiring every talented machine learning engineer, computer graphics artist, um, software engineers, anybody interested in this space of uh, you know, machine learning, synthetic data, uh, autonomy, computer vision, perception. And we have a lot of open roles. Even if you don't see a role for you on the website, please do get in touch with us. Um, we love finding people who are uh, smart and passionate about this kind of work. We'd love to bring you on board if you want to work on these kinds of things. So with that, uh, we've got a bunch of questions in the chat. So I think we're just going to transition to this open question session. Um, again, feel free to type any more questions you have into the Q&A box and, and we'll try to answer them uh, in order. So um, one that we have at the top here is, does the synthetic data set cover the temporal domain behavior of the cyclists? Uh, and if so, uh, this person is also interested in whether the data set models the behavior of the cyclists, i.e. can be used for motion slash behavior prediction training. Um, so yes, the first, first answer is yes, this is a, all of these are temporal sequences. All of the data that we generate 
at least has the ability, if you want it to be a temporal sequence, um, to show things in motion, continuous motion over time with animation. You know, for example, our cyclists will pedal on their bicycles. When they come to a stop, they will uh, take their feet off the pedals and lean over and put their feet on the ground. You know, they have all of that kind of temporal uh, animation to them. Um, and then the answer to your second part, can this be used for motion slash behavior prediction training? Absolutely. Um, this is where I would recommend going to, actually I can just show it right now, going over to the blog section, um, which is one click away from the open data sets section and scroll down to this interview with Adrian here um, and, and the blog post right above it, which is uh, focused on beating the state of the art and object tracking. And that is the research that Adrian's team did. Both of these two blog posts go into a lot of detail about how our synthetic data actually helped TRI beat the state of the art in multi-object tracking. And that's specifically for things like cars, cyclists, pedestrians. Um, so yeah, the answer to your question is yes, the data is temporal and yes, it can be used for training motion prediction. And then another question we have here is, apart from photo, photorealism that you referred to, does the motion model used inside your virtual world for the virtual moving elements, i.e. how realistic it is, play a role in ML detection performance for cyclists and pedestrians? Yeah, that's a really good question because it's frankly an open area of research. And I'm going to pass it over to Philip to maybe uh, give a, a secondary answer to this. But um, my answer there is, um, we believe that the realism of the motion of uh, pedestrians and cyclists and things does matter in the sense that you want to see that those varieties and poses, especially if you're doing detection, you want to see people in different poses that you would see in the real world. And then if you're trying to do temporal sequence detection, or if you're trying to do motion prediction, the motion of that person does actually help you predict what their future motion might look like. So um, I'd, I'd say, yes, we believe those are important. Um, one thing, a future piece of work for us would potentially be to actually show that empirically in research. Um, but Philip, any, anything you'd want to add there from your experience in training these kinds of models? You know, in general, I would agree, like, especially for non-rigid objects like pedestrians, they, there is a lot of variety in, in the poses that a pedestrian can take. So, um, yeah, just in general, when you look at the performance of your model, you sometimes see that it's just performing bad on people sitting down because you just haven't seen much of that. So as Kevin mentioned, we, we still have to prove this in a more extensive research, but like just from what we've seen so far, I would say it helps to being able to cover all those different kinds of motion, motion abilities of agents. Yeah. Awesome. And then just working down the list, we've got one from Yoav that says, what other information other than bounding boxes is in the data set? Can other labels be calculated for tasks other than detection? So I, I think kind of like a two faceted answer here. For this data set that we're releasing today, specifically for the bicycle detection data set, that just has 2D bounding boxes. Um, and you can, again, you can see those bounding boxes here in, in the preview section. Um, but if you go back over to our main website and just go to the data visualizer, you can actually see a more fully featured synthetic data set. And I'm just going to pop over to the 2D camera view, for example. Here we have all of all sorts of labels that you might imagine. The, the 2D bounding boxes that we've got with the data set we're releasing today, um, 3D bounding boxes, 2D semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, depth, uh, optical flow, and then kind of the, the likewise kind of labels for the, the 3D slash LiDAR data, uh, instance labels, semantic labels, uh, cuboids, things like that. And um, our platform can generate all of those different types of labels. And if you would like data sets that have those types of labels, please do get in touch with us. We Our platform generates those all the time. Um, but for the cyclist detection data set, because this is so focused on just improving cyclist detection in camera, this data set only has the, the 2D bounding boxes. We will be uh, releasing more open data sets in the future that have more of these types of labels, um, but generally we'll make them task specific so that we can release a data set in conjunction with showing how it actually improved real world performance on some kind of task. Interesting to mention here though, is that we have also information about like temporal correlation of boxes. So if they're on the next frame, we know that it's still the same instances, so they're tracked. And also, um, what's always part of our data set is that you can also get the, the, traje the trajectory of your ego vehicle, as well as all the calibration. So if you would, for example, take the Numages setup, which has multiple cameras, you have all the information like you need, apart from depth, to also transform from one camera to the other or correlate instances between cameras, which might be helpful to you in your object, object detection network. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that addition. 
Okay, uh, we just have, I think, two or three more questions here. So um, Ravi asked, what makes synthetic data samples jointly trained on real samples better than using advanced data augmentation, such as instance mix-up that can be made class sensitive? Does the change in pixel value distribution improve the model generalization? Um, I'll, let, I'll let Philip answer the majority of this, but if I understand the question correctly, um, our belief is that yes, the, the additional examples that we're actually providing that were not within the original collected real world exact domain, the ex additional examples that our synthetic data is providing is providing additional variety that is boosting the model performance um, beyond what you would be able to get just from augmenting and remixing the samples that you had already collected in the real world. But Philip, you can probably uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, for one, I would agree on that. And also you have to take it, like consider that context matters a lot to CNNs, no matter how much you shrink your images down during training. So if you only have a fixed set of training images that you use and then start to always insert objects at the same more or less positions, because th those are the scenes that you already recorded, you won't get a lot of variety in the, in the background context. And also like conditions like other weather or day and night, which is very easy for us to just vary. So have the same scene with different um, weather conditions. It's actually hard to do this later on if you just augment some instances into an image and also I would say it's actually pretty hard to do this, like augment objects into images without having a very obvious gradient change in your image that in the end might just also affect your model performance. And to your point with generalization, we also just to see how it, if generalization changed in our experiments, um, evaluated our models that we trained, for example, on synthetic and real kitty data on the new scenes um, validation set. And they also saw that like adding synthetic data also made the model generalize better since we got better evaluation scores on the new scenes, uh, new images validation set as well. So I would also say, actually claim that synthetic data makes your model generalize better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, super helpful. Um, okay, I think uh, uh, one question we've got here, um, how would cyclist detection work in tandem with car detection in the real world? Is there a possibility to beat the performance of models trained on real data versus models trained on synthetic data where the ratio of cars and bicycles are balanced and not skewed and one-sided? And so, yeah, I would say that, you know, the answer to this is yes, we, you know, uh, we definitely can beat the performance of, of skewed real world data sets by rebalancing those classes. I think it's a lot of what, what Philip was showing today. And um, one thing that we maybe didn't go into quite as much detail on is that when we were getting these boosts in cycle cyclist performance, we were doing that without compromising performance on car and pedestrian detection. So we were able to hold car and pedestrian detection flat and actually even in some cases improve it slightly and then give a big boost to the cyclist detection. And that's, I, th I believe what we were showing by showing the mean average precision bar graphs in addition to the cyclist bar graph. So the um, cyclist bar graph is specifically for the cyclist class, but the mean average precision included cars, pedestrians, and cyclists. And so showing that, hey, we can get a big boost on cyclists while also not sacrificing and in some cases improving the performance of other classes at the same time. And also we have to mention it that we got those improvements by just changing the data source. So we, so we didn't touch anything about the whole training setup, uh, about the model architecture, loss, losses, or, and so on. So I think you could probably get another couple of percentages out of this if you start to iterate on the whole training setup and not just the, the data here. But we just wanted to show how easy it is to get performance improvements by just changing the data. Exactly, yeah, and it is really worth doubling down on that. The, the objective of this exercise kind of per the, the data centric ML movement is to show taken off the shelf model architecture like YOLO V3 um, and provide a huge performance boost just by iterating on the data. In a parallel domain, that's really what we're all about, giving you a set of software APIs and UIs to actually generate better data so that you can improve model performance um, beyond what you would be able to do just with uh, architecture tweaks. Okay, the last, I believe the very last question we have here um, uh, let's see, I'm, there's some sentences up front, but the question is, is a camera set up for creating the synthetic data critical to performance boost? Should it be somewhat similar to the real camera setup? So, I, you know, I, I think that my answer here would be, 
it has to be pretty close. Um, you know, if we've got completely different camera setups um, between the real data and the synthetic data, the model's just not going to be able to generalize between the two. And if for that reason, we generate a synthetic data in the exact sensor configuration of the data set um, of either the kitty data set or the new scenes data set. And we have found that the closer you can match those two things, the better your performance will be. I imagine, and I think we've even shown in some internal research lately, even if you've got, if you've got very slight differences, the models can be somewhat tolerant to that, but it's typically not going to be a positive impact to have those two, two, you know, if you've got a camera tilted a little bit down relative to how it was in the real data set, for example, you're not going to make your model better, um, but it won't completely break everything. But where we've seen the best performance is when we've been able to most closely match the, the real world sensor configuration. So whenever we're generating data, whether it's for an open data set or for a customer, um, we're sure to match their sensor intrinsics and extrinsics as exactly as possible. Um, did I capture that right, Philip? Any, anything you would add? No, actually, nothing to add. In general, it's just you, you're making the whole problem statement a bit more difficult as soon as you also add variance in your camera positioning. So. Um, the extreme case would be to having a camera placed anywhere in the world, but of course, if you place it on a vehicle, like there's not much variance or not, not as much variance, but still in the end, you're changing your problem statement a bit and just makes the whole task a bit more, a bit more difficult. Exactly. Okay. Um... I believe that is it. We'll probably wrap up from here. Oh, there is one more question I'll answer really quickly. What map do you use? And um, so we procedurally generate 3D worlds from a, a large set of, of different map data sources. All of the locations that we generate are essentially based on real world locations, but we have 3D environment generation algorithms that actually create procedural variations of those. And that's one way we're able to get a lot more variety in our data um, than, than other alternatives. So. Cool. Okay. I believe that's actually all the questions now. Um, thank you everybody so much. Thank you so much, everybody for coming. Um, we've, again, the data set is here for your download. Um, if you are a, don't be scared away by the non-commercial terms. If you are a commercial company, please just get in touch with us and we're happy to, uh, you know, make some specific exemptions as long as we can support you in the research that you're trying to do. Um, if you have any questions, you can get in touch with us through the support section down here, which will give you an email address that you can send messages to, um, and as well as a, a citation template at the bottom. If you do end up doing any research on this data, please do include that citation. So thanks everybody, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.